Well, thank you. Um, and I would like to invite Jürgen Mittelstraß now to present his kind of introduction. Actually, the complexity topic was originally proposed by him. So uh, we asked him to introduce from his point of view uh, complexity. And in the next two days, we will give our uh, contribution to that topic. Mr. President, Chancellor, dear colleagues, let me begin our plenary meeting with some considerations concerning some concepts that belong to the basic terminology of science but which are not used in everyday scientific work, such as the concepts of natural law and causality. Such concepts touch on the epistemological foundations of science and thus transcend individual disciplines and presuppose a particular interest, the interest in foundational questions of science. Not everything that belongs to these foundations is self-evident and not everything that is said about them in philosophy of science is universally accepted which in turn lies in the fact that we are dealing with different theoretical approaches. Theory meets theory, and this does not always go without conflict. In the following, as a short introduction to considerations of a theoretical, methodological, and epistemological uh, nature, I offer some brief explanations of a conceptual nature oriented towards the concepts of complexity, reduction, and holism. In a comprehensive presentation of the role that the concept of complexity plays in the development of modern science, we read, complexity determines the spirit of 21st century science. The expansion of the universe, the evolution of life, and the globalization of human economies and societies all involve phase transitions of complex dynamical systems. And further, the theory of nonlinear complex systems has become a successful problem solving approach in the natural sciences from laser physics, quantum chaos and meteorology to molecular, molecular modeling in chemistry and computer assisted simulations of cellular growth in biology. On the other hand, the social sciences are recognizing that the main problems of mankind are global, complex, nonlinear and often random too. Linear thinking and the belief that the whole is only the sum of its parts are evidently obsolete. In fact, complexity has become not only an important topic, but also the key to scientific explanations in all areas of science. This does not necessarily mean that conceptual clarity has been achieved in questions of complexity. For the concept of complexity displays different scientific meanings, depending on the area to which it is applied, even while the basic meaning remains constant. Are the concepts used in different disciplines similar or may a phenomenon be, for instance, biologically complex, but physically not? Does the fact that some problems are in principle unsolvable for reasons of complexity due to limited time and computational power pose a problem for scientific practice? Shall our practice just ignore problems we cannot currently handle? Or can science render apparently complex systems in simple underlying theories? Furthermore, is there a difference between complex and complicated, such that some complex systems are not actually complicated, even though all complicated systems are indeed complex? In general, again, complexity has become an important area of research in many disciplines in the last decades. For instance, the complexity and the ensuing unpredictability of weather systems has been known for a long time, and theoretical tools to master complexity have been developed 
in biology, where the apparent complexity of organisms has been used to argue against evolutionary theory, as well as in economics and social theory, where so-called complexity theory aims to help us understand systems which appear unsystematic. As to the distinction between complexity and complicatedness, the greater the number of objects and relations of a system, the greater its complexity. Complicatedness depends on the inhomogeneity of the object area. There can thus be systems of high complexity, but small complicatedness, for example, organic molecules composed of numerous elements of few different kinds, whereas high complicatedness as a rule leads to complexity, for example, organisms. No wonder that the theory of complex dynamic systems in which cause and effect connections are nonlinear, for instance, in the motion of more than two bodies under the influence of gravity, is currently becoming ever more influential, especially because of its many applications. Another example, the prediction of the de developments in the weather. This discipline closely joins newer mathematical methods, such as chaos theory, to older methods from statistics and probability theory. In as far as the reduction of complexity is done in explanatory intent, this is achieved especially by model building. Models serve to simplify complex structures and to visualize abstract structures. Thus, astronomical models, for instance, in the form of orreries, were viewed in the sense of the first purpose, simplifying structures, and physical models, for instance, in the form of the atomic model, were viewed in the sense of the second purpose, visualizing abstract, non-intuitive structures and mechanical models, for instance, in the form of corpuscular models, generally in the sense of both purposes, describing visualizable situations that were nonetheless in the need of explanation by the basic concepts of space time, mass, and force. As a rule, we should differ differentiate between scale models, analog models, and theoretical models. Scale models are enlarged or miniature replicas of real or imaginary objects, for instance, in the three-dimensional representation of the DNA molecule. Analog models represent an object in a structurally similar homomorphic other object, for instance, in the form of the planetary model of the atom in physics, or computer models of the brain in the philosophy of mind. Theoretical models consist of a set of assumptions and equations with which the essential properties of an object or system are to be grasped, for instance, in the intuitive case, in the form of Bohr's atom model or of billiard balls models in the kinetic theory of gases. As a rule, a complex state of affairs cannot be completely grasped even when models are applied. This is, for instance, the case where chance plays a role. The Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, that is, the theory of microphysical phenomena, assumes an irreducible ontological contingency that is the existence of absolute change in the physical world. The assumption is not uncontroversial. For instance, Bohm's interpretation of quantum mechanics suggests that the quantum world can in fact be grasped with causal deterministic vocabulary. From this and from the fact that Bohm's interpretation and the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics are empirically undistinguishable. It follows that it may not be possible to find out whether there is really absolute chance in the world or not. All arguments for and against seem here to be relative to a physical theory and its interpretation. How are we supposed to know whether, remembering Einstein's admonition that God does not play dice, 
there is not the possibility of a deeper deterministic description that excludes accident while coping with complexity. Not only philosophy, but natural science as well, has its difficulties with chance and necessity. Nothing is changed by the circumstance that complex relations cannot be completely grasped. This can in turn be elucidated under the concept of predictability. Even in a deterministic world, there are limits to predictability. Two reasons can be given in support of this. First, deterministic chaos. This refers to the strong dependence of a system states of affairs on the magnitude of defined parameters. Since the magnitude of these parameters can never be known, the prediction of system states of affairs is, boundly, is bound by uncertainty, which translates into a range of different developments in chaotic systems. Second, the problem of a Laplace's demon. This label, created by Dubois Raymond, refers to a fictitious superhuman intelligence which, under the assumption of a stable, closed, and all-determined system, typical for a mechanistic worldview, knows all initial conditions of all possible movements and thus can predict the location of any particle for every point in time. Now, quantum mechanical systems, in contrast to relativistic physics, where differential equations describe deterministic uh, systems with, the, with regard to their state variables, are non-deterministic with regard to conjugate variables such as position and momentum. Rather, they are statistical, that is, incalculable, even by Laplace's demon, an implication confirmed by recent developments in physics. But whatever holds for a deterministic world also holds for a complex world and its reductions. With the concept of reduction or reductionism, philosophy of science denotes, on the one hand, an essential aspect of scientific theory formation and, on the other, a procedure that describes the successful reduction of one theory to another. In general, the concept of reduction involves tracing back entities, concepts, or theories to others. Reductions serve the goal of unification of the scientific world picture through the use of a uniform, as a uniform a conceptual system and consequently ontology, as can be had, and the elimination or replacement of philosophically or methodologically problematic concepts, or the entities they refer to, by unproblematic concepts. Examples are the reduction of phenomenological thermodynamics to statistical dynamics, the reduction of Mendelian genetics to molecular genetics, and the ontological reduction of psychological processes to physical processes via theory reduction of psychology to neurophysiology. Now, a claim for derivability of the reduced theory from the reducing theory presupposes that both are compatible with one another. But since the reducing theory is designed to correct and improve the reduced theory, this in turn presupposes that both are incompatible. That is, the formal and informal conditions of reduction cannot be satisfied simultaneously. The correction of T1's laws by T2 precisely excludes their derivation. This again is the reason why Karl Popper, against the idea of reducibility of theories into each other, defends the incompatibility of successive theories. Now, compared to the approaches represented in the program of reduction, analogies display a weak form of relationship between entities, concepts, or theories. Here, the point is that the connection can be materially different, but formally the same. 
we should distinguish between structural and functional analogies. If the correspondence of particular relationships among the elements of a system with one another is reversely unique to those among elements of another system without there needing to be a correspondence between the elements themselves, we say that both systems agree partially in their structure or that a structural analogy holds between them. If one grasps similarity as agreement of two systems in certain, not all, characters in the sense of properties of the elements or element groups, then similar systems agree also in the relationships between the corresponding elements or element groups and are thus structurally analogous. The line of thought pursued here in the case of the concepts complexity, reduction, and analogy lead in the philosophy of science to a position that on the one hand turns against the reductionist program, and on the other hand represents the attempt to do justice to the actual complexity of scientific objects, concepts, or theories in a different manner as well, namely in the sense of a unity to be regained, a holistic unity of disciplinary and transdisciplinary explanations. Under the designation holism are to be understood methodological approaches to the explanation of conceptual or empirical phenomena that take their point of departure from a holistic point of view. Conceptually or methodologically, the issue is in particular the distinction between the part-hold relation and the element relation, since wholes are understood as compositions of parts, but not merely as the sum of their parts. This is the cause because the relations determining the composition make the whole an independent unity whose qualities cannot be completely traced back to the qualities of the parts. The concept holism was introduced in 1926 in a biological context. It also plays a role in the interpretation of quantum theory and in social scientific theory formation and in the theory for confirmation. Because we are dealing in many of uh, the speeches today and tomorrow um, with um, uh, biology, I just um, uh, keep this uh, shortened and uh, in, pass on immediately to a few remarks on um, the idea of holism in the social sciences, just a few remarks. In the philosophy of the social sciences, methodological holism is the view that social relations can only be interpreted and explained in terms of social wholes. This holism is methodological in so far as it primarily refers to the conditions of understanding. The counterposition is so-called methodological individualism as advocated, for instance, by Karl Popper, among others. According to this individualism, all social relations can be explained out of the actions of individual persons and their interactions which in turn can be traced back to motives and beliefs and thus need not necessarily refer to social wholes. Opposed to this uh, position, advocates of holism, such as Karl Marx and Emile Durkheim, postulate the impossibility of abstracting from the influence of social institutions on the behavior of individuals. According to Marx, social conditions and their development can only be interpreted in categories of social totalities, such as relations of production or classes. For Durkheim, institutions such as family or religious communities act as social facts upon the individual. As an aside, let me remark that holistic approaches lead to the concept of emergence in so far 
as it is the system properties that give us information about the behavior of the system. These properties are in turn emergent. Emergence says, again, that it is impossible to use characteristics of elements and the interrelations between these to describe characteristics of ensembles or make predictions about them. The core element of a strong emergence thesis is a non-derivability or not non-explainability hypothesis of the system characteristics shaped from the characteristics of the system components. An emergent characteristic is non-derivable. Its occurrence is in the sense unexpected and unpredictable. Weak emergence is limited to the difference of the characteristics of systems and system components and is compatible with the theoretical explainability of the system characteristics. Weak emergence, in turn, is essentially a phenomenon of complexity. Here, too, our considerations return us to the concept of complexity, which is, from the perspective of philosophy of science as well, the key concept of the modern development of science and points to the future, possibly also to the limits of scientific progress. Thank you very much.